We are now ready for our sixth session in the book of Hebrews. In the book of Hebrews, we are clearly seeing that the founders of Christianity, who is Jesus Christ, is superior to the founders of Judaism. Now, we see he's superior to the prophets, he's superior to the angels, he's superior to the man Moses, and he's superior to the man Moses in a variety of ways. First of all, in relation to the house that is built. Secondly, in relation to the rest that is offered. Thirdly, in relation to the priesthood that is established. And fourthly, in relation to the covenant that is mediated. Now, we're going to finish that session today on relation to the covenant mediated, which we saw in chapters 8 and 9, and now it completes in chapter 10 and the first 18 verses. So in these first 18 verses of chapter 10, we see the effectiveness of the sacrifices of the two covenants are compared. The effectiveness of them is compared. Now, I remind you again, keep the Bible open and follow word for word. This study of the book of Hebrews is very simple, and uh, therefore it doesn't take a great deal of explanation. Now, watch in chapter 10 and verses 1 through 18, first of all, in the first four verses, we see the insufficiency of the sacrifices of the law. The insufficiency of the sacrifices of the law. Now, verse 1 says, For the law having a shadow of good things to come. It was not the real thing. It was only a shadow of that which was to come. And that which was to come was Christ, uh, who was to come to be the full propitiation for sin and not the very image of the things or of the facts. So the, the law was not the very image of the facts. Uh, so he says, therefore, they can never, with those sacrifices, or with those kind of a sacrifices, which they offered year by year, continually make the comers thereunto perfect. So those kind of sacrifices cannot make the person perfect. Uh, they cannot completely abolish his sin. It had to be by faith in the coming of that promised Messiah. Now, he goes on to say, for then would they not have ceased to be offered? Now, that's a very logical question. For if they were completing and it was good enough, then wouldn't they have been ceased to have offered? You'd offered one time and that had been enough? But he says they were not sufficient uh, because that the worshipers once for all having been and being purged should have had no more, no longer a conscience of sins. For had it been perfect and they'd been totally cleansed by it, then those who were worshiping and offering the sacrifices should have been totally cleansed and had no more conscience of their sin but totally forgiven. But in these sacrifices... There is a remembrance again made of sins every year. That is, in these sacrifices that are made under the law, there is a continual remembrance of the fact that there is sin. So he says, it is done annually at, as the high priest goes into the Holy of Holiness. So there is a remembrance of sins every year. For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and of goats should take away sins. Very, very clear statement. So he says, it is very obvious that the law could not take away sins whatsoever. So the very insufficiency of the sacrifices of the law, they were not effective at all. So the first covenant is therefore displaced by the second. And we see that in verses 5 through 10. So the first covenant is displaced by the second. Now verse 5. Wherefore, when he cometh into the world, that is, when Christ came into the world, he saith, and now he quotes from Psalm 40 and verses 6 through 8, Sacrifice and offerings thou wouldest not. Now he's saying now, God, Father, the sacrifice and offering, you would not. That's not what you wanted. But a body hast thou prepared me, Christ, who was always preexistent, took upon himself a body that it was prepared by God. And there's a great deal of explanation that goes into that, which I take time to go into on the DVD on science and scripture as to the person of Christ. Uh, thou hast prepared a body for me. 
in burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin thou hast had no pleasure. God really didn't have pleasure in those things. Now notice, this is the words that Christ is being uh, speaking to God. Then said I, here's what I said, Lo, I come, now in the volume of the book it is written to me, Lo, I come to do thy will, O God, Psalm 46 through 8. So he came to do the will of God, he says. That's the purpose of Christ coming to make full propitiation for sins. So above now, when he said, now he's repeating something that he just quoted, sacrifice and offerings and burnt offerings and uh, offerings for sin thou wouldest not. That's not what you wanted. Neither had pleasure therein. You didn't have any pleasure in those things. Which are offered by the law. Now these kind of offerings and sacrifices are, are according to the law. Then after he said that, then he said, Lo, I come to do thy will, O God. Now, when he said that, I come to do thy will, he taketh away the first, that he may establish the second. So, Christ came to do away with that which was insufficient in order to give, make a sufficient sacrifice to do the will of God to give himself in death upon the crosses as it explained in several epistles of the New Testament. By the which, now this word by is E-N, which is I-N in English, in the which will, that is, in the will of God, we are sanctified, perfect participle, we are having been and being sanctified or set apart through the, suff through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. So, once for all that sacrifice, and this second covenant displaces the first, and once for all we have a pure cleansing in him. Then notice in verses uh, 11 through 14, the one sufficient sacrifice of the heavenly priest contrasted with the endless daily sacrifices of the human priest in the Levitical system in verses 11 through 14. Now in every priest, every priest standeth daily ministering, that is publicly ministering, and offering oftentimes the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. So they're constantly offering the same sacrifices that are not able to ever take away sins. But this man, uh, this man Jesus Christ, who is our high priest, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins, which was himself, he forever sat down on the right hand of God. Forever. I mean, it was over. It was not to be repeated again. He sat down forever on the right hand of God. From henceforth, expecting till his enemies be made his footstool. Sitting there and waiting until that time when all of the enemies are made the footstool of Christ. And that comes at a future date. Now, verse 14. For by one offering he hath perfected forever, or he has perfected uh, unto the end of the age them that are sanctified, or them that are being sanctified or set apart, who are set apart unto God by faith in that person and work of Jesus Christ. So we see the one sufficient sacrifice of the heavenly, heavenly priest is contrasted with the endless daily sacrifices of the human priest because those daily sacrifices did not achieve a real setting apart unto God, but that once for all sacrifice of Christ did. Then notice in verses 15 through 17, the prophetic provisions of the new covenant are rehearsed. Now they've been stated before. But now he repeats those things and rehearses them in verses 15 through 17. Uh, whereof, or that word notice in italics, it's the word but, but the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit, also is a witness to us. For after that he had said before, now after he said this in Jeremiah 31, 33 and to 34, this is the covenant that I will make or covenant with them after those days, saith the Lord. 
I will put my laws into their hearts, and in their minds will I write them, and their sins and iniquities or lawlessnesses will I remember no more. Uh, so this is Jeremiah 30, 30, uh, 31, 33, and 34. Now, He's rehearsed then the same prophetic message. He just said it was going to be different. And now notice the need for further offerings is done away with because of complete forgiveness in Christ Jesus, verse 18. Now, uh, he said that we can have remembrance of those sins no more. There is there's no more remembrance. There's a full forgiveness. Now, where remission of these is, that is, all of the sins where remission of these is, there is no more, there is no longer uh, offerings for sins. There's no longer ever to be done again. So there's no need for it whatsoever. So he's pointed out very clearly from the chapter 1 all the way through 10, 18, that everything in relation to what we have in Christ and Christianity is far superior to the Old Testament Levitical system and the law under Moses and everything under him. Everything in Christ is superior to the prophets, to the angels, and the man Moses in every way. The law that was given, the sacrifices that were offered, they were incomplete and could not make anyone perfect, but Christ giving of himself once for all did. Now, up to this point, we have seen that Christ, the founder of Christianity, is founder is uh, superior to the founders of Judaism. Uh, he's superior to the prophets, he's superior to the angels, he's superior to the man Moses in relation to the house that is built, in relation to the rest that is offered, in relation to the priesthood that is established, and in relation to the covenant that is mediated. So now, through the remainder of the epistle, he is saying that since Christ and Christianity is superior to Judaism, we have a greater encouragement to go on in faithfulness and serving him, regardless of the pressures and the persecutions that may come upon us. Now, this is vitally important even for us today. Uh, we are beginning to face persecutions and pressures in Christianity as never before, especially in the history of our nation. These pressures are coming, persecutions are there, and uh, as I understand the Word of God, it will increase and get worse. We need to be ready to face it and take our stand. Now, we are encouraged to go on and be faithful. This encouragement to go on may be described with four words in the remainder of this epistle. Courage, faith, fortitude, and holiness. Now, this we see in 1019 through the remainder of the epistle. Courage, faith, fortitude, and holiness. Now, in the remainder of chapter 10, we see that it's courage. We should have the courage to go on because of what we have in Christ in verses 19 through 39. Now, notice, first of all, a word of exhortation in verses 19 through 25. A word of exhortation that is given. Now, notice in verse 19 through 21, the divine condition for the promise. Having therefore, brethren, now notice he is speaking to the brethren, having therefore, brethren, boldness or freedom or confidence to enter into the holiest, that is the holy of holies, in the realm or sphere of the blood of Jesus, by new, that is a newly made and living way, which he hath consecrated, uh, or which he has inaugurated for us, that is, through the veil, that is to say, his flesh. So the flesh of Christ that was given and uh, was beaten for us was the veil that was like the veil of the temple which was rent, that we have direct access unto him. And having a high priest, or having a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart. Now, he says we should approach and we should draw near. Now, notice here in verse 22, we're to draw near unto that God. And if you're to get near to him, you cannot get near to God by telling him how great you are. 
you get closer to God by showing interest in Him and what He's interested in. Getting our life arranged according to the Word of God and serving accordingly. Draw near with a true heart. Let our heart be true and real before God. Consecrated in the things of the Word according to its teaching. With a true heart in full assurance of faith. Having a full assurance of knowing what the Word of God is teaching and what we should be doing. Draw near unto Him. Having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience. Having had and having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience. Now, we are to be having a life that is purified and cleansed as we find error and sin in our life. We're to confess it. We're to turn from it. We're to determine to go on and be right with God. And he's going to name more specific things here in the following statements. Having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water, the pure water of the word. Now, not only are we to draw near, but we are to hold fast. Let us hold fast, or we should be holding fast the profession uh, or the confession of our faith or of the hope which we have in him. Don't be shaken from that confidence that you have of a profession of the faith that you made in Jesus Christ. Hold to it. Don't let anyone make you doubt it. Have a firm conviction concerning it and have it without wavering. No doubting, no vacillating, no questioning about it whatsoever. Why? For he is faithful that promised. God who promised it is a faithful God and we can depend upon him. But not only that, he says in verse 24, he says, and let us consider one another. So we're to be very considerate of one another as the children of God not backbiting, using derogatory statements and comments about others. We're all different. We need to have a love and a concern for one another in understanding what is truth. I may have some displeasing ways about me that people don't like. Other people have ways about them that I might not like. But he says, let us be considerate of one another. To what end? To provoke or to incite to love and to good works. Now this word to love is the word agape. It is a form of the word agape which means to highly value God in one another. So we are to have consideration of one another with a, with a, with a, with a attentive, continuous care for one another. To provoke and excite, encourage one another to have this high value on God and upon fellow men. As we show it unto others, then they can more readily show it unto us. But even if they do not show it to us, it is our obligation responsibility to show it unto others. And stick to good works. Encourage and excite one another to good works. Uh, then in the first part of verse 25, he says we're to be encouraged to be not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner, custom, or habit of some is. Now there's many believers, good people basically, but saved, but they forsake the assembling. They let anything come ahead of them from assembling themselves together with God's people in the house of God in church services. <clears throat> we find a trend in our day in which people are having less and less services, they cut out Wednesday evening, then they cut out Sunday evening, and after so long a time with Sunday morning only, churches die. We see many of them fall aside. They think because not many people are coming, we ought to not have the services. We ought not to assemble together. My friend, we do not make those decisions on the basis of how many are coming. We make the decision on the basis of whether it's right before God or not. Whether others assemble or not, we ought to assemble. And it says, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together. So many people, they have anything else to do that comes ahead of attending the services and assembling together as the children of God. He says here, 
let us not forsake the assembling of ourselves together as the manner, habit, or custom of some is. Some would rather go out skiing, uh, go on a field trip, go visit a relative, or anything that can take the place of assembling together. They, many people will go one service a week only. And notice what else he says here. Uh, not forsake the assembling of ourselves together as a manner of some is, but exhorting one another. We are to exhort and encourage one another. Encourage one another in that faithfulness and attending in the assembly. And so much the more as you see the day approaching. That is, as we see the approaching closer and closer to that day of the return of Christ, we are together more and more. And we are to encourage others more and more. But we're doing the exact opposite. In many cases, we have shorter services. We have fewer services. And he says, as that time approaching for the return of the Lord, as that day is approaching, then we ought to be a- assembling more frequently and longer periods of time, but we are going over it. It is a sad situation when so many people think that if a church service goes over an hour, it's criminal. Now, that is criminal to think that way in itself. We cannot put God in a box and say you must work with us in this time period. The real successful growing large developing churches that are sound in Bible teaching over the country are those that have longer services, most of them at least an hour and a half long. Now, if we cut things down to suit the people, we're going to destroy ourselves. As it has been said, he who whittles himself down to suit everyone will soon whittle himself away. And that's what churches are doing to themselves at times. So he says here, the human conditions for the promises is to draw near to God, to hold fast, consider one another, not forsake the assembling, and to encourage one another. And then we see a word of warning in verses 26 through 31. Verse 26 through 31, we see a word of warning. For if we sin willfully or willingly, Now, if we sinning willfully, it's a present participle, we sinning willfully, after that we have received the knowledge of the full knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more, no longer sacrifice concerning sins. The word for is not God's peri, concerning or surrounding sins. Though there's no other sacrifice for it, just the one that's already been made. Now, the willful sin that he's speaking of here is the same thing that we've been looking at throughout the entire epistle. That is the sin of standing off from God. Standing off from the faith and not continuing to follow in full confidence and obedience unto him. Not following in the ways of God. As these Jewish believers were doing, standing aside, considering even going back to the ways of Judaism rather than following God and being faithful. So he says, we willfully standing aside and not going on. Uh having received the full knowledge of the truth as these believers had. And as many people today have received the full knowledge of the truth concerning their salvation and position in Christ are standing aside and not going on and being faithful to the things that we're told to do. He says, I want you to recognize there's no other sacrifice for sin than that. But what is there? For the one who stands aside, there is a certain fearful looking for or there is a kind of fearful expectation of judgment. God's judgment and chastisement can come upon them, and fiery indignation or fiery zeal or fervor, which shall or which is being about to devour the adversaries. That zeal of God will devour the adversaries, and if you stand aside and continue to identify yourselves with the crucifiers of Christ, as we saw in chapter 6, then God's judgment is coming, and we must answer to that. Uh, So then he says, he that despised, now he's given an example of people being under God's judgment, and here he's talking about those who are adverse to the things of God who are the children of God, not the unsaved world. Now notice the example uh, he gives. He that despised, or uh, anyone having set aside Moses' law, 
died without mercy or compassion. Now under the law, those who set it aside, they had death pronounced upon them uh, under two or three witnesses. If there were two or three witnesses of the fact that they had set aside the law and, and gone away from it, then they were to be put to death. We have found a lot of this in the Old Testament scriptures under the law of God. So he said, if that is true, of how much sore punishment, suppose ye, shall he be thought worthy who hath trodden underfoot or having trampled upon or treated contemptuously the Son of God and having counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified or set apart to God an unholy thing or a common thing. Now, if you consider just a common thing, an everyday thing, it's just common, and you do not go on with the Lord as you should, how much more are you worthy of God's judgment upon you than those were who under the law by two or three witnesses had uh, acted against and contrary to the law? They had death upon them. How much sore punishment should we as believers who trample the work of Christ and the blood of that covenant wherewith we were set apart unto God a common thing and hath done despite unto or insulted the spirit of grace. We insulted the spirit of God. Now that Holy Spirit of God whereby he gives us favor, that undeserved favor from God. And we don't think it great thing. And we show insulting behavior toward it. How much more are we worthy of a judgment? For we know him who having said, Vengeance belongeth unto me. This word vengeance means the full meeting out of justice belongeth unto me. I will recompense, saith the Lord. I will pay back. I will render back the justice, the Lord says. My friend, we cannot get away with it. We may think we're doing fine. We may be feeling well and enjoying life in the flesh. We may be having a great deal of money and pleasures and possessions and think God is really blessing my life. While going the way of self and the way of the world, the Lord is the one who knows and sees all, and he is the one who will recompense. Vengeance belongeth unto me. I will repay, saith the Lord. And again, quote, The Lord shall judge his people. Deuteronomy 32, 35, and 36. The Lord is going to judge his own people. Not just the people of the world, but he's going to judge his own. And Many times the judgment of the believer is in this life instead of having to wait until the end. And that judgment sometimes comes in chastisement as we saw earlier in the epistle. And that chastisement comes to his own children because he loves us and is to bring us back around to follow in the holiness of God. Now notice, it is a fearful thing it is a dreadful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. And my friend, many may fall into the hands of the judgment of our living God because we seem to have a despite for the grace of God and what he has done for us rather than going on with him in faithfulness and being obedient to live the life that we ought to live. We're to draw near to him. We're to, have a, to be holding fast to the truth of the God in our profession of the things of Christ. We're to be considerate of one another. Uh, we're to be not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together and encouraging one another in these things to love and to good works. Now, we have then, last of all, in verses 32 through 39, a word of reminder. Notice in verse 32, but call to remembrance. Call to remembrance is one word. It's a present tense verb, which means you keep in your remembrance and always remember. Don't ever forget this. 
the former days. You remember the former days in which after you were illuminated, you were enlightened. Remember the days when you were first enlightened and came to full understanding of the things of God. Ye endured, ye Hebrew believers endured a great fight or conflict of afflictions. You endured a lot of those things when you were first saved. You put up with them and endured a great deal. Partly, whilst you were made a gazing stock, both by reproaches and afflictions, and partly, whilst you became companions or partakers with them that were so used. You became partakers with others who were treated that way with great persecution and affliction in the early days of your salvation. For ye had compassion on me in my bonds as well. Now throughout the book of Hebrews, there are many, many indications that the Apostle Paul wrote this, and this is one of the great ones here. Personally, I think he did, but it doesn't matter who wrote it. It was given by the inspiration of God. For ye had compassion of me in my bonds as well. And you took joyfully, now get this, you took joyfully the spoiling of your goods by the Hebrews who did not accept Christ as Messiah, knowing in yourselves that ye have in heaven a better and an enduring substance or possession. Knowing you had the spoiling of your goods, knowing that in heaven you have even greater and enduring possessions that will be forever, be through eternity. So you endured those afflictions. So you call to remembrance now, and don't forget, you continue to remember the early days when you first believed and what you endured in those things. So therefore, you cast not away your confidence, your boldness. Don't cast away uh, this confidence that you can have, this courage that can be yours. So continue courageously following in the things of the Lord. So cast not away therefore your confidence and courageousness which hath great recompense of reward. If you hold steadfast and constant, if you show that courage to be what God would have you to be and endure those persecutions and afflictions and conflicts, know that it has a great recompense of reward. So he's reminding them of these things. For ye have need of patience or endurance. You have need to endure all of these things. Why? That after you have done the will of God, you've done the will of God by enduring and being faithful, you might receive, you might carry off what is one's own, the promise, that promise of a greater possession. Now, Verse 37 says, for yet a little while. Now there, there, there's going to be that great possession in the future when we are with the Lord. Now, he says to us, for yet a little while, and he that shall come will come. The time is going to be, we do not know when. But he says, and he that shall come will come and will not tarry. He won't hesitate when that time comes, he's going to come. Uh, so he says now the just shall live by faith but if any man draw back my soul shall have no pleasure in him now let's look at that again he says now the just one shall live uh out of the result of faith. That word by is not dia, it is ek, ek, which means out of the result of faith. And the word is not but, it's kaya, not de, but if. The word if is a third class conditional clause. The word draw back is in the subjunctive mode. If any man draw back, so he says, now supposing anyone, when you have a third class clause, Coupled with the subjunctive mode, you have what we know in English as a supposition. Now, the just shall live out of the result of faith, and supposing any man draws back, any believer draws back, 
knowing that he's been justified through his faith in Christ. Now, he's drawing back and not going on to the Lord. He says, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. Now, he is quoting from Habakkuk 2, 3, and 4. But we are not of them who draw back unto perdition or uh, to, to destruction, but of them that believe to the saving of the soul. Now, let me give you a literal rendering of verses 38 and 39. But the just out of the result of faith shall live. And suppose one may let down or draw back for himself. He lets down and doesn't want any, and he draws back some. He does it for himself's sake, not for the Lord. My life has no delight in him. But we, notice here, the author of this epistle is including himself along with these Jewish believers. But we are not shrinking back unto a death or a waste or a consumption. But we are of a faith unto a preservation of a life. We are unto a faith of a preservation of a life and our faith means that our life is preserved and we'll have that eternal blessing with Christ. Although some may not be faithful during that time, God has no pleasure in that. I hear people saying all the time, well, it doesn't matter what I do, God loves me anyway. Well, that's true and it's not true. It's all determined by what word for love you are using. Agape, yes. God always highly values all humanity, saved and lost alike. But phileo, no. God doesn't always phileo love everyone, which means to find delight and pleasure in. And he does not find delight and pleasure in anyone who draws back. Anyone who is not faithful. And without faith it is impossible to please him, we're told. Now, we must be faithful. Since what these people have and what we all have in Christ is superior to what was in the Old Testament Levitical law, we have a greater encouragement to go on and to be faithful with the Lord. And that encouragement to go on can be described with four words, courage, faith, fortitude, and holiness. Now, the word courage we find in 1019 through the end of the chapter. Uh, so, we have this exhortation to go on. There was con divine, divine conditions for the promise and the human condition for the promise. And that human condition is we're to draw near to God, hold fast to the things of God, be considerate of one another, provoke to love in the good works. We're to not forsake the assembling of ourselves together and be encouraging one another. Then there's a word of warning. From willful standing off from God and not going on with him, then a word of reminder of the fact that we shall face the Lord one day and we will give an account for our life. In this life, if we are not faithful, he has no pleasure in us. But if we are faithful, he has much pleasure and delight within us. But in either case, he is faithful to his promise and we will have an eternal dwelling with him in the future. What we do is dependent upon our own self-will. We have a freedom of choice. We still have a free will to choose to be obedient or to be disobedient. What we choose is left entirely up to us. But it also determines what the state of our being and blessedness will be throughout all eternity. What do you choose?